Dear Bramblings, it's your Uncle Luke here. Hello, everybody. How's it going? I hope you're doing well. Welcome back to the Dear Brambling Podcast. I'm so happy that you've tuned in for another episode. I'm really happy that you're here because um, I've got one of my favorite people of all time as a guest. Her name is Rachel Helton. Now, if the last name seems a little bit familiar, almost as if I've had another guest with that same last name, well, you'd be correct. Um, I did actually have Rachel's older sister, Sarah, on the podcast um, a little while ago, and there will be some links to her podcast down below if you are interested in tuning in. However, today, Rachel and I are going to be talking about a dancer's perspective on joy. Yes, that's right. Rachel Helton actually is a professional dance artist, choreographer, teacher, and healing facilitator, as well as a mentor currently based in the unceded indigenous land belonging to the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Soto, as well as the Suela Tooth Nations. She has a BFA in dance from Simon Fraser University. She also practices a lot of different interdisciplinary methods, and uh, she really has a thirst for unearthing stories that live within our bodies. I'm really excited to be talking with Rachel about just dance and joy, as this has been um, one of the things that really forged our bond together. Now, uh, if you are curious to learn a little bit more about Rachel, I will be posting a lot of her uh, social media and other links down below. Her dance and uh, choreography has been seen all throughout the Vancouver area, as well as internationally. She has performed pieces in Florence, Italy, Buenos Aires, Argentina. She's gone to Portugal, uh, New York, Spain, Germany. It's really incredible, actually. I'm really excited to be bringing you this conversation. Now, I should be warning you guys, it is a two-parter conversation, so tune in next week for the next part of that conversation. And also, keep in mind that this conversation was recorded in the summer of 2023, last year, and uh, some things in Rachel's life have changed just a little bit, but it should not affect the context of her conversation here. You know what, guys? I think it might be best if we just jete into the conversation here, and I'll see you on the other side. Does that sound good? Awesome. See ya. Hello, Luke. How's it going? Pretty splendidly. I'm really thankful to be here with you today. It's been, uh, I think, a heavy experience internally as well as collectively in the past years slash life. And then also (laughs) simultaneously feel really blessed. Um, And so greeted with that a bit more levity in the past days. And yeah, and whenever I talk with you, I feel really safe and supported so that feels lovely to me too how are you feeling What's no. <laughs> oh thank you yeah i am i am feeling so excited to have you on um i am very excited because i know we have some intense and lovely conversational chemistry of some sort at least that's how i see it whenever we get together and talk and now to record it and get to listen back to it and kind of have it as like a time capsule of some sort to bring us joy whenever we want is going to happen. And I'm really excited about that. And I'm also just uh, filled with so much gratitude to have you here. And yeah, talking about dance today, 
something that we both share, something that we have a passion for and unique and complex and nuanced relationships with. And I'd love to just dive into it. Part of my process is I like to type out some questions and I like to send it to my guest and I kind of get the gears going, I suppose. However, if today turns into a derailment of all those questions and we just jump right in, I'm so down. But yeah, something I usually like to start off with everyone is I like to just ask, would you be down to maybe tell me a bit of your story, Rachel? Absolutely. Yeah, I just, as you were speaking to in our connection and and our cousinhood. (laughs) Our cousinhood. And I just was having all of these images of you as a little one and then growing up dancing. And then that time we were dancing in the family reunion together. Right. To In My Life by the Beatles. And I just feel really uh, moved and you're so cute. (laughs) I just, yeah, remember our little child selves and yeah, it makes my heart happy because I think they're very present in this topic and in our connection. Mm -hmm. And even the other day when you were over and you slept over and we were able to to connect and I remember waking up and just being like, oh, I want to play with Luke. Like, I hope he's up. Like, (laughs) so I kind of feel that way right now. Aw. Yeah. (laughs) what else tell me more yeah I guess I can start by just for viewers or listeners that uh, don't know me I can just introduce myself a little bit the little spiel I say when I'm guiding a process or teaching a class and people don't know me but yeah I work as a dance artist and choreographer and teacher so I primarily do freelance work and then I also work as a healing facilitator so I use the modalities of breath work and Reiki, sound healing, divination, tarot, um, intuitive guidance, and then Jungian psychology. And I love imbuing these things in all parts of my life or imbuing kind of these healing modalities also in the work I do as a dancer, because for me, dance is incredibly healing for the mind, body, and spirit. And something else that I just wanted to preface with because I've been thinking a lot about my why of being here and it's pretty lofty and (laughs) I could talk about it for a long time but in a in a more succinct way I feel that my aim in this life is to help amplify love in the world through my heart and art (laughs) and I also am a really big advocate for gentleness I think that sensitivity and gentleness has been conditioned to be seen as like a a weakness in the world historically and I think it has been because it's actually a strength and very powerful and so I just wanted to preface with that because I feel it's important to as we talk about my story and yeah so I will begin a little bit and please stop me if I go on for forever Uh, no (laughs) no hey Oh, good. Please. I'm, I'm, I'm here. Like I'm strapped in, buckled up, like, oh my gosh. Also, I just want to just say that when you said I'm here to show my heart through my art, I'm like, it rhymes. So it must be perfect. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) exactly. I love poetry and I love writing poetry. So anytime things rhyme, I'm, I'm especially pleased (laughs) with things for that. And yeah, you'll be a part of this story. So this will be lovely. And yeah, I'm just really inspired by you also in sharing your gifts in this way. I feel it's so precious and important. And because we're family, it has a like a deeper layer of preciousness to me. So, no. but yeah, so you know a lot of these things. But for, <laughs> for your listeners, I come from a big family. I'm the youngest of four siblings. My sister, Sarah, um, who I think you interviewed also, has two boys. And I usually say little ones, and they're growing rapidly now. So, <laughs> And then my brother, Jeremy, is the next one. And his beautiful partner, Rebecca, who's my sister in spirit, and their dog, Rosie, that I get to be an auntie to also. And my brother, Ben, um, who I get the privilege of living with. And that is me. And I also live with my beautiful, loving, and super patient partner, Ezekiel, or Essay for short. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But yeah, dance has been always a constant for me. I come from a family of a lot of artists, um, primarily musicians, as you know. 
but there's also some writers, some actors, some visual artists, animators. There's a lot of people who are environmentally conscious or focused on social justice as well. And I found growing up in that environment to be really nurturing because when I had um, proposed to my family as a three-year-old <laughs> and then throughout my life, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to be a dancer, that they were supportive of that. I know that's not the case for everyone. And it was such a privilege to be put in classes and to have had that constant throughout my life. Because I do think dance for me has not only been life affirming, but also life saving. Mm. And I started dancing when I was three first. I think I went to a community center for the first year or so. And then I remember my mom picking me up from class and she was a dancer as well. And she looked at me and I could tell she was really wanting me to like it. She was like, so Rach, like, Rachie, did you like it? And I was like, yeah, I love it, mom. And I remember. <laughs> and that's kind of continued throughout my life. And I remember my sister, Sarah, was a big point of inspiration for me and, and continues to be throughout my life. But I would watch her in dance class as a as a toddler mm -hmm. and be dancing in the corner. And I remember this feeling of like, that's what I need to do. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the really beautiful qualities of my family experience, too, is that I'm really close to my siblings. We've really supported each other. And through a lot of trials and tribulations and kind of habitual trauma, <laughs> they've always been uh, there for me and supported me in remembering kind of my own worth and taking me out of many dark nights of the soul. <laughs> and uh, part of that too is um, a precious thing about our family. As you know, John Luke, because you're a part of it, <laughs> is that there's a lot of family jams. So we love karaoke, any sort of holiday, Christmas, camping trip, there's going to be multiple guitars and, and people singing. And so as much as dance is my main medium, I also really love singing. I love writing, um, particularly poetry, and I love acting. I haven't done it um, so much recently, but it makes my heart really happy too. And I'm a big, big water baby for those who subscribe to astrology. <laughs> mm. My sun is in Cancer, my ascendant is in Cancer, and my moon is in Scorpio. And so anything water-based, I'm really... <laughs> happy about and my mom also has this deep love of the ocean and so growing up I was supported in this way because she would just sometimes stop in front of the ocean and jump in in all her clothes and I was like yes <laughs> and she really helped me to and continues to help me kind of really absorb the beauty of life and soak up um, the present moment in that way and the preciousness of our connection to nature and Oh, and I love scuba diving. We went scuba diving in the Philippines together, you and I. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Super amazing. And I did my certification there with my brother, Ben, who has a natural aptitude for that and most things. <laughs> yeah, and that's also another aspect of our family is there's my grandpa, Jerry, was a pilot, and so was my father mm. and my grandma, is a world traveler like she she likes to tell people and it's very true and so that really supported me also in my life to travel and then experience different ways of being and just be reminded that you can find the sense of family and everyone in every place um, just to explain a little bit more about my experience <laughs> in the world being Rachel Halton this go around I also grew up going to Catholic school as much as that was traumatic in its own way. There was some beautiful qualities in that experience. Like I have some lifelong friends from elementary school or high school, but there's definitely, I would say more in the stage I am in now. I resonate with being a spiritual person and kind of take my beliefs from all over. And so anything that resonates with love and oneness, um, mm -hmm. And I really connect with aspects of Buddhism and Taoism and then just lean towards things that resonate with me in my life. And I went to, after high school, I went to Simon Fraser University for dance, which was also a really incredible privilege and 
was really life-saving um, because I think around that time when I entered school, 2012, was a particularly hellish time in my family personal experience and then in my own personal life and in, in regards to relationships. So in some way it was helpful to have something where I was continuously being asked to embody, to express my soul, to move through these complex emotions and to find some support in that way. Because I think one of my main ways of dealing with kind of habitual trauma that we experienced was through disassociation. And so having a practice that was like, oh, you need to feel your toes to do this tondu was really helpful, even though it was also incredibly frustrating at times when I would disassociate so frequently and be like, well, <laughs> I don't remember what the exercise was. And yeah, all this to say these experiences of pain and kind of the ancestral trauma that we experienced together has really led me towards this desire of bringing the love of dance and the healing capacity for dance um, to communities and to my loved ones. And also has led me to, again, kind of move out of where I grew up in BC and look beyond to other places in the world, other cultures, other practices, as well as look towards other healing modalities. And depression as well as suicidal ideation runs in our family. And so I also experienced the loss of, I, there's five friends that I've lost to suicide and we lost a friend also recently this year, not to suicide, but in a really horrific accident. And I think all the while moving through these things, I return to these practices to give me a sense of solace and connection and meaning. Mm -hmm. And I really don't know who I would be without dance and it's complex because it's my main love and <laughs> my first love and in terms of like my forms of expressing but it's also been one of the most complex relationships that I've had mm -hmm. because it hurts me sometimes <laughs> yeah I equate a lot of my worth to to my craft or I often found myself over identifying with it and mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of going into these uh, self-destructive patterns also and it can be quite a painful thing that something that brings you so much joy can also be a catalyst for pain and I think over time with that wisdom I've discovered that this pain comes to the surface in order to be looked at to be understood and to be healed and when I was little I remember seeing the pain that my family was experiencing and feeling that, oh, if I can absorb some of it, maybe it will lessen it, or maybe I can love more, and it will, uh, like, absolve their pain or um, bring them some peace, and it has been, it was really disheartening noticing, like, oh, actually, <laughs> it's it's not my responsibility as a child to, to do that, and as a, a person to hold that pain or absorb it mm -hmm. and yeah but it kind of led into those dark nights of the souls where I felt quite helpless in my ability to support people but then I found over time through the communities that I'm a part of as well I was like okay what we have to offer as artists is the opportunity to alchemize this pain because I think it's a ancient practice for us to be storytellers and mm -hmm. I think it's interesting now in this medium that we're communicating in and this moment is that it's a return to that. It's almost like a radio show and it's almost has this feeling like I love podcasts because it feels like when my mom and dad and siblings used to read me stories um, growing up and it gets me back into that, that place of connecting to the pure essence of our humanity, mm. which is, I think, this oneness, this wholeness, this sense of family. And so, yeah, thank God for dance. One of the really like beautiful privileges of this experience is that dance has also led me to different corners of the world. So um, usually when I'm traveling, I like to focus on dance training or a dance process into it because it allows for me to understand more deeply the essence of the people and the culture there. And I find because it is a universal language, it's a way that we can express beyond words and also when you dance with people you feel this level of intimacy that's 
kind of in my experience unparalleled I think it's similar to creating art with people in general you get to feel their soul and, and witness it and so even friends that I might not talk to all the time but if I go to dance class with them I feel like wow like I know you <laughs> mm. or at least I feel your essence in this moment and you feel close to to people in that way and but yeah nice and long-winded <laughs> let me know if you want any other no, details <laughs> I, I love this thank you for sharing all of that because I just I feel so connected I have a huge understanding of where you're coming from I relate to so many things that you're just saying being the youngest as well associating self-worth to dance everything <laughs> it was lovely yeah I was curious like did you ever do like competition in dance yeah I did do competition and um <laughs> to a fault I'm quite a people pleaser and I'm working on this in, in the ways that it's not helpful mm. <laughs> and in some ways that it is like when I have a true desire to support people and people please I I honor that but kind of learning when it's just a trauma response or a reflexive fawning as mm. a way of survival versus true desire so this showed up a lot in competition because I remember even doing track and field growing up or any sort of competitive sports and I could feel or sense like, oh, this person really wants to win. Like, I don't care so much. And, mm. <laughs> and so I remember, for this is not dance related, but a track and field race that I was a part of. And I remember being like, well, you, you can go ahead. Like, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I think you want to win more than I. I was also not fast at all. I am much faster at swimming and yeah, dance definitely is my main form of exercising and moving. But in competition dance, it was daunting for me because I found it strange to be judging movement or someone's soul's expression, especially mm -hmm. like in the ages of when you're a child to adolescence and your body is changing and moving and yeah, the toxic parts of the dance realm is this kind of measurement of our, our bodies and mm -hmm. the judgment of that. And I know that really affected my my loved ones as well as myself. And it was highlighted in competition because you're being just compared to other people. And I have always had a deep love for performing. Like I feel when I'm in a theater, I feel at home and I feel that there's parts of me that come alive in that space and there's something magical that happens when you're being witnessed and sharing your heart through your art in that way. But also it was a difficult thing for my ego and sense of self-esteem because I definitely wasn't one to really you know there's those dancers that were like always getting first and I would just be like well I know they're gonna get first so I'll mm. just enjoy the performance you know. Oh. <laughs> And appreciate the fact, too, that I had a ballet teacher and contemporary and jazz teacher that were so emotionally intelligent, so supportive, compassionate, that it really made a huge difference in my life. And so they were aware from when I was little that I had a kind of aptitude for choreographing or I loved making dances. I would, if my mom was sad or I wanted to just cheer her up or just share with her, I would like dance for her in her room. And she was really supportive of that. And I would be making dances all the time. And so thankfully my teachers in the creative process of making a solo opened up space for me to share my ideas. And because I come from a family of a lot of musicians, it was really important to me what music we use. So they allowed me to choose. And so it was a really fun process in that way. Mm. And I made really good friends in the competition realm. But yeah, it was also strange to be in a place where people are quantifying your art. And I experienced this in SFU in the dance program I was a part of in university because every week you would be graded. And so sometimes mm. I would be dealing with a lot of depression or disassociation and a lot of pain and then I just knowing I would be marked on that or be marked if I was away so I would show up a lot in a really horrific place in my mental health and it was this environment where sometimes I'd be told you need to leave that at the door leave your emotions at the door when it's like mm -hmm. I can't my heart is here and we're contemporary dancers so <laughs> yeah it's gonna wow. be 
deeply feeling and vulnerable work that we're doing together. And even though we're focusing on technique in this class, I can't detach from my feelings. And I also feel like that's what makes a really powerful dancer too, is being able to invite in the complexity of those emotions, that open heartedness and truth through our bodies. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Wow. Gosh, I, what I'm noticing coming up for me is definitely that empathy, the, the understanding of, you know, how hard it can be having people constantly comparing our bodies because dance is essentially an art form where we use our bodies to make the art. So it's only logical that people would start comparing our bodies, but just how damaging it can really be to really want to love something and people telling you all these reasons why you're not worthy of this love right Mm, and yeah it can be such a delicate thing to hold on to i love that we're also talking about pain in this conversation that was intended to be talking about dancing joy because i think there is an intrinsic link between both like grief and joy and pain that you were talking a little bit about how your dance teachers that you grew up with were just so supportive and were very nurturing in that way. And I think something that kind of comes up a little bit for me is, I don't know, some type of envy, I guess. I get kind of envious when I hear that simply because I'm not saying that I am trying to bash my past teachers. I'm just trying to highlight that in the Irish dance culture, it was sometimes the teachers didn't have the students in mind. I think in the dance yeah. realm in general. Yeah, I guess there's just a bit of that envy hearing that you've had some of these teachers in your life that really just you're using some words like compassion and nurturing and kind. And I'm not saying that I didn't have that. It just looked really different. What were you going to say? No, I just wanted to validate what you're saying. And I really appreciate you sharing because I've had a really vast array of teachers, mentors, choreographers that I really love and trust and some really dynamic experiences that were healing and supportive and some that were damaging. And I also would view the ones that were more damaging as like they were reflecting or kind of sharing also their lineage of pain in some way because I started with ballet and that lineage can be really really tough really um Mm. beholden to these more archaic ways of being or traditions that just not in alignment with how I want to be in the world in terms of like us needing to be a certain size or way of being and things are shifting a lot in the dance realm but and I won't say any names, or <laughs> but I was also part of this youth company growing up where there was more of this kind of rhetoric around like, oh, if you want this part, you need to go on a soup diet. And I remember being mm-hmm. in the company during my adolescence. And so they would measure you and measure your height and size for costumes that they already had. But I remember feeling humiliated because they were like, oh, you're too tall or you're too this or your thighs are too big or these things. And so there's this kind of embedded shame in just who I was and who a lot of us were. And there was a bit more using shame as a way of teaching. And I have compassion also to like where that may have come from, but it's definitely something I don't want to continue. And for me, because I've taught and teach a really huge range of ages so from like two years old to 94 years old and I mostly teach uh, like older adults now but when I was teaching little ones I felt like oh this is especially fragile and delicate and important because they're so impressionable and they're trusting me and Mm. their parents are trusting Mm -hmm. me and I heard from so many of my friends like oh I was in ballet when I was little but my teacher said this and then I stopped or and not to blame them but it was important to me to be aware of like okay let's put on my wisdom and my sensitivity and my emotional intelligence to be in this role as well and I feel like in the education system at large as well in the art sphere and then world leaders as well I wish everyone was trauma informed and anyone who's guiding someone else I wish that we had this understanding and support so that we had the tools to teach and guide all sorts of people. Because for me, I'm 
primarily a visual learner and kinesthetic. And if my teachers knew that, and I'm again, like sensitive, so I can get overwhelmed if there's a lot of noise or these things. And if my teachers knew that, it would have been so much easier, <laughs> maybe. Mm. Again, thanks mm -hmm. to my ballet teacher. <laughs> I love her so much. And they had that, thankfully. But it wasn't something I always found in every environment. And mm. something now that I'm in roles as a dance educator, or choreographer, collaborator, is that I want to keep that in mind. And some beautiful things are shifting in the community. Like, well, I also lean towards contemporary dance because it was more freeing to me I didn't wasn't so mm -hmm. tied to these really harsh traditions and rigidity not that ballet is always that way there's a lot of fluidity and, and openness now too but and the contemporary dance realm was more of this focus on healthy bodies and like longevity mm -hmm. and I have mentors that are dancing into their 70s and they're doing amazing work or 60s, 50s, and they're like more fit <laughs> than a younger version of me. And so, yeah, really inspiring. And yeah, that's kind of the focus on like, how can we take care of ourselves and one another? And so something that's happening in the contemporary dance community now, which I've been kind of adopting more is this, we start with like check-ins a lot in a creative process. So how is everyone today? Mm. It's not gonna be the same as it was yesterday. So I like to ask people, like, how are you mind, body, and spirit? What are you bringing into the space? Is your knee hurting? Let's be aware of that. Is your heart hurting? Let's be aware of that. Are you having a hard time focusing because of X, Y, and Z? Then, like, that's part of our experience together. And we also ask more, what is your pronoun? So I'm like, thank God. Mm. <laughs> how do people want to be talked to and loved? Mm -hmm. And we're also bringing this into the space more of what is accessibility needs. So mm. for me, I have symptoms of CPTSD, which means that sometimes I will have flashbacks. They can be emotional flashbacks or more visual or mental. And it can be really confronting in a process to be like, oh, I was moving and emoting. And then all of a sudden I'm in this space where this trauma is here with me and I can't really focus mm -hmm. and I need to either go cry or breathe and just like feeling free to share that in a creative process or a training makes me feel safe to be like okay I can do this thing without like being shrouded in shame or just moving through life wow. and the way that I need to yeah wow. and so yeah it, it opens up space for people to feel free to express what they need and it's something that I hope ripples out into other communities in the world because it's made a huge difference for me. Wow, yeah. I've been studying a bit more about the creative process these days and just feeling so inspired every time I learn something new. And something that keeps coming up in the study I'm doing is the need for safe spaces. And I talk about her a lot, but Dr. Sarah Lewis from Harvard when she was writing her book, The Rise, she really talks about embryonic safe spaces, like a safe space where you feel as though you're almost in the womb. Oh. And yeah, it really links me to thinking about growing up. I always had an affinity for butterflies. I always just loved how the wings were symmetrical and beautiful. And that was the only thing I'd love to paint when I was in preschool. And um, we were fortunate enough in preschool to actually witness the life cycle of a butterfly. My teachers somehow got a whole bunch of caterpillars sent to them and they put them in little fish tanks filled with twigs and moss and other like foresty things. And as the weeks went on, me and my classmates got to look at all the caterpillars eating their leaves and crawling all over the twigs. And then suddenly they would find a spot on the branch and spin themselves into a chrysalis. And I remember when that part of the life cycles started to happen, I went to my preschool teacher and I was like, why are they hiding? Like, I want them to come out. I want to see them. And my preschool teacher then said like, well, Luke, you wouldn't want anyone watching you when you change, would you? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> And then she kind of pulled me close and she said, if you force them to come out now, you're going to hurt yourself and them. So we need to let them come out when they're ready. 
And I thought that was such a powerful moment in the moments, just being like a three-year-old. But when I reflect on that moment, it's just the most profound life advice that a preschool teacher is giving me. And it really is connected to the creative process and how when we're trying to change and grow and learn something new and go through metamorphosis, there is so much pain, there's so much strife, there's so much trauma, but what comes at the end of it is your crown achievement of beautiful wings, right? Again, what comes up for me is a little bit of grief, a little bit of envy, a little bit of frustration, maybe a little incredulousness of like, why didn't I get this <laughs> growing up? You know, I feel really sad just realizing if I had a more supportive environment growing up in the Irish dance world, or if the teachers created a value in their school where safe spaces was the priority, oh, I can only imagine what my success would have been. Something that I have been reflecting upon in my own journey of dance is that dance was fueled by my fun, you know, like fun was the main gas. It would gas me up and light me up inside. Like going to dance was just so fun. I loved it. It's important. Thank you. I really appreciate you sharing and trusting me. Yes, absolutely. And I wanted to say too, that just because I have the privilege of knowing you in a deep way, being my cousin, and I feel like what you bring to your dancing and then the communities that you are part of are helping shift this. And discovering this value of joy and fun and playfulness and igniting the spark of the inner child within us all. Like, this is why we create art often and or to move through the complexity of what it is to be human and experience existence mm-hmm. in this way. And yeah, I wish that we all had more tools to hold one another in that. And I know for myself because i feel that family is a microcosm of the macrocosm of the global family and so Mm. i was thankful as when i was moving through this trauma or if i was being bullied there was at least like we would take turns holding each other and picking each other up and now that i've had space to reflect on everything that's happened (laughs) in my childhood i have so much more understanding and compassion and gratitude for my parents' response to what they experienced and mm. and wanting to bring out the aspects of that microcosm of the family unit into the world to be shared. And then also the things that we learned that were potentially harmful is shifting that together and talking about mm. it and making space for that also. And yeah, for some reason... <laughs> I feel like because I was was talking about my siblings and my mom, I feel like talking about my dad too, but I (laughs) just having that balance also of the divine and feminine and masculine within myself and within one another and feeling that support. And so I feel like the divine masculine can be this container for the feminine flow of things. And I felt like I received that from my father in a really supportive way or continue to. And then how can we use that to create these spaces where our creativity can flow freely, that play can be present and that freedom. Mm. During the pandemic, I was teaching this uh, online dance class for a while and it brought me so much joy because there was my 55 plus friends in this community, the intergenerational dancers that I work with, and then also some people from different parts of the world. And I think I advertised the class as like, join us for a dance class to cultivate joy and freedom and (laughs) this is kind of my modus operandi for being in in the community is sharing that and igniting that and so Mm -hmm. thank you for doing the scene wow (laughs) it just sounds as though there's a lot of joy in dance for both of us and then it almost feels as though joy (laughs) it also comes with a lot of pain as well and I love that we're not shying away with, from it because it's so true there's a lot of pain when we experience something that we truly love I almost feel as though love is one of those perfect things in life that us humans can't fully understand because it's both the worst and best thing 
ever, you know what I mean? But just how privileged we are to get to experience love and love for something or someone. It's so amazing. I was curious, however, the different people that I connect with, I find that everyone has a different way of describing it, but how do you describe joy? Um, this is one of the questions I really loved and I pondered it. So here we go. <laughs> joy to me is a lightness of spirit and a state in which we feel the divinity of our soul. Mm -hmm. It is laughter, connection, and pure presence. Like if when we're laughing together, I feel fully in that moment. And I have had a really difficult time being in the present moment throughout my life. And those moments where I'm able to really feel with all of my senses and allow for this laughter to bubble up and this joy to be with in me through the beauty of nature or my friends and family and loved ones through movement or anything in this way it's it's really powerful <laughs> joy is powerful as well it's so powerful yeah and i was actually looking through one of my books called atlas of the heart and there's a whole section on joy so i was super happy but atlas of the heart describes joy as sudden unexpected short lasting and high intensity it's characterized by a connection with others or with god nature or the universe Joy expands our thinking and attention, and it fills with a sense of freedom and abandon. Joy is the good mood of the soul, an intense feeling of deep spiritual connection, pleasure, and appreciation. Yeah, snaps to that. <laughs> snap, snap, snap. Absolutely. You know, and what's really fascinating about joy for me right now is that we're so quick to numb it. Yes. Right? Do you ever have those moments where you're just, you, you maybe notice joy, but you numb it so quickly that maybe even forgot you felt joy? Absolutely. And I've been exploring this because it's one of the most perplexing things about being human. Because I felt like for myself, I noticed this pattern over time that because I was so used to chaos <laughs> mm. and would identify a lot of this kind of sorrow and or anxiety that I would persistently experience that that became familiar to me and my nervous system mm -hmm. and so sometimes when opening up to joy and love I would find that really confronting and of course I would have lots of moments of these this joy and beauty and, and love in my life but sometimes I would have a difficult time sustaining that mm -hmm. and feeling safe in that because it felt so immense and so enormous and I even recently, because I've been studying more somatic healing and was moving through this process and kind of talking about this experience of trauma and my whole body was like contracting into a shell. And mm. my teacher, Louise, was asking me what a body really wanted to do. And I was wanting to open up and expand my chest. And then it was this moment of openness and and joy and then I felt nauseous almost like my body was like oh mm. too much <laughs> mm, fascinating and so I've been trying to intentionally practice being in the present moment more through these different modalities and practices and art and creating an intimacy and connection and see if I can increase my tolerance for joy because mm. I think I had the conditioning also that a lot of the lessons we learned through suffering so I've been trying to rewire this, but through the mantra and understanding that we're able to learn our lessons through joy and love and pleasure and presence and all these other aspects of us and other emotional states. And so, yeah, and, and I think historically too, being recently in Germany also, I was reminded by this really intensely of like, there was a lot of things that occurred for us, a huge scale in regards to war fueled by this illusion of separation that mm, created the space mm -hmm. of like it's not safe to feel expansive and who we are and joyful and as a woman also i know that that <laughs> lineage runs really deep too that it wasn't safe for us and i know mm. certainly if i was alive in a certain time i'd probably be burned at the stake for being a witch so <laughs> i think that still lives in our dna mm. through what our ancestors moved through and i just so thankful for them because they paved this way for joy for us and freedom. They went through so much 
so that we can be here. Yeah. And and then may we continue paving that way and expanding this possibility for joy for future generations. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the uh, support work that I'm doing right now, I'm kind of learning that joy is actually one of the biggest triggers for relapse in those with addiction. It's really fascinating because in our culture, we are so conditioned to, you know, go get a drink, go get a beer, pop a bottle of champagne. Celebration is intrinsically linked to substance abuse of some sort. Maybe not abuse, but like substances in general are linked to celebration. And it's really fascinating. It's almost as if like addiction or harmful behaviors in that way are something that we turn to because joy has a pain to it. It is painful. I think if someone was to tear your joy away from you, it would be one of the most painful things ever. And that's why we guard ourselves so frequently when it comes to experiencing something joyful. But yeah, do you know of any other examples of like what could get in the way of feeling joy? You bet your bottom dollar there, Luke. <laughs> Thank you for your wisdom. <laughs> <sighs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> Anyways, keep going. Yeah. So yeah, there's a couple of things I want to express, but I think one of our main obstacles to joy is not having safe environments to soften into our joy. If we're so used to kind of bracing ourselves for attack in our personal lives or throughout our ancestral lineage, because that's been the case for a lot of us. And oftentimes these environments that are being created that might be more hostile can be made in the physical world by stress, abuse, all of these systems that are not supporting gentleness and openness and love and connection. And then they can also be these internal environments that we are creating as well because we are bracing ourselves from this past hurt. And this can often come from a sense of unworthiness and fear in my experience. And I think our world today again, doesn't make these environments that make us feel safe a lot of the times. It's very, especially in North America, I've noticed <laughs> this a very individualistic society. There's a lot of, even in the English language, it's like, I am, I feel, it's very egocentric. And our ego is a divine mm. part of us, but it's, there's a, a lot of us versus them, which creates this illusion of separation rather than remembering our interconnectedness as I'm remembering more of this indigenous wisdom of all of us are relatives. And like, for me, I really resonate with that deeply. I was like, my relative is also the tree and the bear and you, and how can we care for each other in this way? And something else I wanted to talk about also is this, okay, so I'll try and explain it because it's helpful for me. <laughs> Maybe it'll be helpful for someone else. But when yeah. I think about energy in general, so we think about the energy of joy. You think about it okay. as a fractal. So in your mind's eye, thinking about this beautiful, complex crystal maybe. Okay. And so there's a fractal of joy. And then on the other side of it is sorrow or grief. And in between mm. that might be melancholy, bittersweetness, connection, disconnection, and all of it's part of this kind of same fractal energy or a crystal. Mm. <laughs> and so I think that sometimes when we're experiencing joy and love and presence, we might feel this fear of it being taken from us. And we know also that our ability to love or our, the profundity of our grief is also a sentiment to how much we can love and so i'm going to quote a marvel tv series wandavision i think paul bettany says it in it but it's what is grief but love persevering and so hmm. that's really really supported me and being present with joy and knowing that it might shift into this grief but that grief is also a sentiment to how much i love this person and how much i love hmm. life and how much i love this moment and experience and so and for me too, whenever I've tried to suppress any sort of grief or anger or anxiety, it bubbles up and manifests into like hysteria or self-destructive behavior or a blow up. And so I think as a humanity, if we can 
hold each other in that space of instead of absorbing each other's pain, we feel it empathetically, of course, but we can also sit with each other next to each other's fire and hold space and hear each other's story. And for me, as an empathic person, I was always perplexed by the world's kind of coldness or desire to move away from this profundity. Mm. And I know it's because it's confronting and it's scary. Even like love and vulnerability is confronting. And so I've, I'm more compassionate to do that now. But for me, I want to be a peaceful warrior in that realm. Like I want to sit next to the other people's fires with them. And I want to be able to hold people's hands in their challenges and their triumphs. And I know for us collectively, it requires a lot of bravery and resilience, but it also requires a lot of softness and mm. gentleness. And so, yeah, all that together saying, it's a lot of things that are obstacles to joy, but a lot that I think even our challenges can be a portal into our soul's greatest strengths. And so, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really excited yeah. to continue helping create a world that has more space for all of this <laughs> complexity and where we can care for each other more in, in this, not just accept people in their joy or in their stable moods, you know, <laughs> like accepting people for mm -hmm. all parts of them. Because I know for me, even recently, I was moving through a lot of grief and I reached out to loved ones and it was helpful to be received with um, a word of, I love you. I'm here for you. I am open to share space with you. Um, I've been there. And yeah. even though it's altogether disheartening to know that so many of us experience this incredible crushing weight, it's also a sentiment to our capacity to love and to care. And my little self was really upset because I felt like, oh, why don't people care? Like, I'm crying and people mm. are not checking on me. <laughs> yeah. And now I understand more deeply of like the nuances of that and I have compassion for that within us. And I also believe in us so deeply that I know we can change and be more loving mm. and tolerant of one another. I love that. I love that so much. guys i'm gonna have to pause the conversation here for right now but i really do hope that you enjoyed this conversation with my cousin rachel helton i love our chats and what i really love is that i've recorded this one with rachel and that i get to go back and listen to it over and over again as i hope you can tell that she is one of my favorite people of all time and yeah i'm really excited um However, uh, if you do want to check out Rachel on any of her social medias, again, I'm going to be posting some of the links down below in the show notes there, as well as some links to uh, my conversation with her older sister, Sarah Helton. Now, just a little um, shameless plug, as I like to do. Uh, if you do enjoy the content that you're listening to here, and you'd like to support it in some way, I do have a Patreon if you'd like to donate um, it is uh, $5. That's it. If you have $5 to spare, that would be lovely. And reminder that 100% of the proceeds to the Patreon will be going right back into the podcast. And that will help um, pay for any editing, any rental space, any new equipment. I really do appreciate if any of you have an extra uh, spare $5. Go for it. Now, with all that being said, I really do hope that you are finding your own little joy today however with all that being said guys i am going to see you guys next week for part two of my conversation with my cousin rachel helton and um yeah i'll see you then
the Dear Brambling podcast is a podcast dedicated to my little bramblings, to the next generation of humans growing up in the world, as well as to anyone who might be looking for a little more guidance in their life. It is hosted by me, Luke Benoit. Editing and sound design are by Cedar Picture and Sound, MB Productions, and Hido Productions. The music that you're listening to is called Curiosity, and it's composed by Matthew Grazier at Grazier Music. The logo was designed by Misaki at Hostess Misaki on Twitch TV. And if you'd like to follow me on any social media, you can do so on Twitch as well as on Instagram at Lucatronosaurus Rex. And to anyone who is listening to the podcast this far in, I just want to say thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. I really do appreciate it. I do, however, need to say that this podcast was brought to you for education and entertainment purposes and should not be used as a substitute for actual licensed coaching, counseling, or therapy. If you are experiencing some sort of pain in your life and you need some help, I definitely recommend shopping around for the right coach, counselor, or therapist that is right for you. With all that being said, I really do hope that you're doing something today to take care of yourself, and I do hope that you have a great rest of your day. Bye for now.